Hey, Scott. George. How are you? Oh, it's great to see you. Thank you. Sorry, I missed last time I had to get my COVID shot. Oh, excellent. That's good to, good to hear. Good to hear. Are you coming along on the uh, thinking skill? I am slowly moving along. I've been uh, busier than expected with freelance work, which has been good. Um, That's good. But it's, it's put me a little behind on, on that whole thing. Um, yeah, I owe you an email. I'm looking at my notes here. I had all kinds of things but, that I wanted to share with you that I thought you'd oh. be interested in. But, you know, it's right. funny. Um, the one that I can talk to you about right now was Juan Tamirez. So you had mentioned oh. him last time. And I looked him up and I was like, oh, Juan, I know Juan. Yes, 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 yes. You know, he's, he's just so. He's a maniac. He is. He is. But I watched one of his. Personally, he's a calm, reasonable guy. He's a physicist. Uh, I mean, if you talk to him, I've talked to him a lot uh, through an interpreter. He's, a, he's just a wonderful, quiet, <laughs> thoughtful guy. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's emo emo emotionally manipulating you. And that craziness he bring it is a relief to bring you up to another level. You can't go to bring somebody up to a level like that. You have to go up and back and up and back and up and back. And then he stops with the with that stuff and he goes on to just blow your mind away. Talking about a one of the world's greatest magicians, Juan Tamari. So you, you went you, you saw him on YouTube? Uh yeah, I looked him up and I had seen his work. Before I used to follow ah. magicians, oh geez, 20 years ago when I was kind of directing my brother's work, um, mm -hmm. he's an age illusionist. And um, yeah, so yeah, Juan is, Juan is, I'm one of the people who enjoys magic for being fooled. I just, I just love it when someone is so ah. good that you can watch them and I so Penn and Teller have a show, and one of my favorite moments was when Teller, the one who doesn't say anything, is up on stage, and there's this master of card tricks, and the guy's doing this this mess of stuff, and Teller knows he's going to get fooled, and he's so excited, he actually gets his feet up on the chair. He looks like a little kid. His whole body is animated. And he's just like this because he knows that this guy's going to do one thing. Teller's not going to know how he did it. And I, I love that moment in a well done illusion when you think, wait, oh man, really? Teller has, Teller has the it. most, he, he knows, he has the deepest theoretical understanding of magic of anybody on the planet. He and I stayed up to like three in the morning discussing magic theory that nobody else is even interested in. Oh yeah. Unbelievable guy. April's here. Hey guys, everybody, sorry. We were just- Hi. Scott and I got a little bit of a head start. No problem. Love that. I love dropping into a conversation the way, about your, magic. Your, your co-piloted series yesterday was awesome. Just really awesome. I so enjoyed the richness of that conversation. Um, and I've been referring people locally to the documentary, hmm. as well as some Super. big groups that are across the country dealing with diversity issues. Yay. There's momentum building in diversity that is just wonderful to see. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's good to see everybody. I'll just be brief. Um, but it's I've you know I'm I'm sort of a lurker in this group and. Uh, I'm happy that I was able to join today. And Judy, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot yesterday. I think um, I think there will be more double dates. <laughs> I think that's cool. It's really cool. I think the more we can cross-populate groups of people, the better. And uh, that's pretty exciting. I, I'm just so excited that right now we're getting not only a wider, but a deeper dive on diversity and inclusion. And it's just, it's, it's, it has the possibility of really being quite powerful. 
it's kind of like an awakening and maybe that'll be part of what will help heal that breach. I just retweeted, I was on TweetDeck briefly and retweeted somebody who was quoting Steve Scalise, Republican representative as saying, as, as describing himself as David Duke without the baggage. <laughs> and well, that may be don't. a fabrication, I don't know. I just retweeted somebody I trust, so maybe that's made up, but it's, if it's made up, it's really good. And if it's real, it's like chilling, completely chilling. And I'm like, how do we, my own take is the only way out of this is to individually, person by person, friendship by friendship, reach out to the humans who believe those things and pull them out of the muck and mire into civilization or whatever we want to call it. Because civilization, like education, is not a word I particularly like. Um, hi, Capuchin. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, oh, good. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to start our our check-ins with you in April because you both, I think, have to have to leave a little before our, our longer time. But um, we'll go through it. But uh, I think trying to rid the world of systemic racism and inbred racism and all those kinds of things is a is a mega super high priority, and it's a very OGME task. It's something that that I would like us to hold in front of us and and figure out uh, from the logical perspective, from the emotional perspective, from the connections and community perspective, from the what's fueling this perspective. There are just so many, so many interesting ways um, this needs to be spun out. Um, so it's lovely to see everybody. Why don't we dive straight into some, some check-ins and uh, Kevin, if you want to lead us off, then we'll go Kevin, sure. Kevin Ingrid Hank. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, I've been working, as some folks know, on this uh, systemic racism <clears throat> solved by getting capital to folks who don't get it. And the particular gap I'm looking at is friends and family funding for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich aunt or uncle. And um, I got a connection. We've got like three churches in pilots to do some funding around this equity fund, because these are folks who can't take debt to then they could get up to being loan funds. But it's a curious gap that's huge and, per, and persistent and, and ubiquitous and unseen. Uh, I was just looking at Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and 95% of the African-American businesses have one employee. But everybody's focused on startups as opposed to getting a one-employee one business where 95% are to three or four employees. But I, I got a connection with a guy who did the merger of the two of the largest black banks who is really interested in, in this, this hidden thing. And so that could be interesting, but I was also part of a broad landscaping of the capital stack with Duke University and other folks. Mm -hmm. And they were going all the way down from big project finance, which is dams and infrastructure to private equity, big buildings, to venture to seed and then to friends and family. And I said, well, what if they don't have a rich uncle? And the guy said, oh, it's like it was a category that he didn't realize because you, you're not asked to do a landscaping of funds or be involved in a fund unless you have connections to money. And so I'm trying to get that landscaping to realize that friends and family is an institutional asset class if you don't have intergenerational wealth. And that's what's ne so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing really hard for that to be on the taxonomy and everybody who is building the taxonomy has friends and family with money. And they, it's really hard for them to see that this should be taken as a, as a, as a thing. Uh, and that, and that going, getting a sole proprietor who's been around three years, 50,000 revenue to three or four employees is a major thing in your town. And they're not gonna grow to a hundred employee business, but having four employees is, is, is huge because 95% of the black businesses, you know, in, in many cities, 92 and up in the nineties, 92 in Cincinnati, 95% in, in Charlotte. And we're, we're looking to try to get national stats on that, but it's like, it's like hidden. And then, then they can't look at the kind of money they need. So anyway, but I'm making progress when I've got three churches that want to be pilots because philanthropic capital needs to have a motivation that is more than financial. So anyway, churches that want to solve the racial wealth gap, investing locally. So anyway, some progress and, and some, some, some really interesting brick walls by folks who just can't see people who aren't like themselves. Like they're all about diversity and inclusion, but not like about people who are different, you know? And, uh, so, Weird how that works, no? 
Yeah, and, and, and so they, they can't see the category of, you know, uh, friends and family is institutional, not like your family. <laughs> so. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll a reminder that we're trying to have our chat be on Mattermost, so it's persistent uh, through the mm -hmm. calls. And um, I just posted a link to a thought in my brain called poverty is a dismal trap. And I need to figure out how to weave what you just said into that thought because wealthy people don't realize that for poor people, everything is more expensive. They have to live farther out of town and take more expensive transportation into the hub and spend more of their time. Uh, there was a really interesting article about uh, a person who was living uh, barely hand to mouth long ago and they had to take their, their a check and cash it at a check cashing store where they paid a huge commission and they were good friends with the, with the teller. Like they, they knew each other really, really well. They had a long standing relationship going and, and then proceed to buy prepaid credit cards because some of the things that he needed to pay for needed a credit card, but he didn't have a credit card or a bank account. So he had to buy, a, so he had to pay a fee to get a prepaid card so he could use the card and a several other sort of layers of, of things where, where his every action, and you know, you have poor credit and you borrow, your terms are much worse than if you're wealthy and you borrow where money is free. So, so all of those things are just transparent. And I'll come back to my favorite uh, quote about privilege. The privilege of privilege is not noticing the privilege, right? Um, and, and here's where maybe simulations or play uh, role, you know, play acting or other kinds of things might actually help because, because spending a few minutes in somebody else's shoes in any form might be actually uh, helpful. It could be. I'm dealing with sort of converted investment bankers building a taxonomy. I don't know, you know, I, I did use finger puppets at the UN, but I don't know that these folks really want to do see playful stuff, but they just can't, you know, it's, 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 it's a category that they it, it, intrinsically friends and family, they think about their Rolodex as opposed to, uh, nobody has a Rolodex anymore, but whatever. What's they, a they, Rolodex? Yeah, exactly. But, but, but it's, it, it, so, so it's like, I had a friend who was a, um, a church historian, and it took her uh, 25 years to get the word S added to tradition, because there were a bunch of traditions, and the dominant tradition always tried to isolate the others and make them a heresy. And so for 20, over 25 years, she got S's included, and which, which really was super leverage, <clears throat> because all the heresies had a place to go, as opposed to being subordinated under the dominant. So, well, you know, changing... Say... When you yeah. say as is included, you mean tradition, <coughs> traditions, tradition? right, right. It, it, make it so a plural. Make it a plural, which means there, there's room for, you know, d diversity in the taxonomy or adding something to taxonomy is like, you just have to bow up and get with it, you know, as we say in football. I mean, you know, you just have to keep, keep banging on it in a way that will keep me in the conversation. So anyway, fighting, fighting to, to widen the taxonomy. Love that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, let's go Ingrid Hank Cappuccino. Oh, hey, can I um, wait till the end, possibly? You bet. I can easily do that. You'd be surprised how accessible that technology is. <laughs> um, so let's go, Hank Capuchin, April. Um, yeah, I don't have much of a, much of a check-in today. Um, I guess I've just really been spending a lot of time reflecting on, um, oh, just, just, uh, how people experience, like how people's experience can be so substantially different and how <clears throat> to kind of bridge that um, I found in some of the conversations that I've had lately is like, uh, and again, these are personal ones with like kind of my friends um, where we like tread this line between being enlightened and embittered. Um, and it's easy to kind of like <laughs> step into each, each one of those spots. Um, but I found that it, uh, sometimes when we hit walls, um, people are just kind of like, well, you haven't experienced what I've experienced. So, you know, you'll never get it. And I'm like, well, then why are we having this conversation? If I, if, if I can truly never understand where you're coming from, then why are we talking in the first place? Right. Um, which is not how I feel. That's really more of a response to like, you know, what are you really trying to say? Are you trying to say that you just don't agree with me and don't want to talk to me anymore? Or um, is that really truly how you feel? And if that's really truly how you feel, then where, you know, then <laughs> why did you pick up the phone or agree to the conversation or whatever? Um, so anyway, this is kind of where I've been at. Um, otherwise, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm just chewing on that. Um, in addition to some of the other stuff that I do to, to make a living. So um, I just want to say, I hope everyone is doing well um, and look forward to just hearing everybody else's check-ins. Thanks. Thank you, Hank. That's great. Um, this gets really personal and the, the conversations you're describing are exactly the kinds of places we need to be. Um, Capuchin April Feet. Um, yes, hi. Um, I, I think I'm similar. I've had to focus a lot on other work uh, the last few weeks, but uh, in midst of that, I'm still working on some heart projects, uh, such as a, a platform that I'm trying to build and incorporating lots of OGME things. Um, I've been rediscovering, going back through some videos, looking at your story threading tutorial, you know, little talk from I think last year and anyways I'm sure I'll get back to this in future OGM calls when uh, I have a little more substance but I just want to say that I'm grateful for you saving absolutely everything and being able to go back through them. Um, I maybe will mention uh, last Sunday I was on a, a small event called an offer and needs market put together by a, a guy from Barcelona and a girl from Berlin and it was like a time banking exercise with bringing uh, 30 people together and making a list of our skills, making a list of our needs and exchanging uh, hours. Um, and it was a, yeah, it was a really wonderful experience. It gave me a lot of hope in alternative economies and it, yeah, nobody knew each other and it was a really, really warm, warm time. So um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Oh, Jerry, you're on mute. <laughs> Darn it. I did that. <laughs> so let's go April, Pete, uh, Julian. That was quite funny because I could, I could hear Jerry because Jerry's about 10 feet away from me. Um, but hi, everyone. Um, I think I know most people, but maybe not everybody. Um, I am Jerry's wife. Uh, I am an OGM member who has not joined for quite some time. Um, mainly because my, I guess my main update is that I've been working on a book, which is now done and sort of in the hands of my publisher and it will launch this summer. Um, it's very resonant with OGME ideas. Uh, Jerry and I like to say that we, we do different things, but there's a lot of really good overlap in an ideal world. I guess we would be one plus one equals 11. Um, and the book is titled Flux, uh, Eight Superpowers for Thriving in Constant Change. So I have been living, breathing, sleeping, eating. Um, how, how do we relate to change? And um, doing that through the lens of, you know, the future of XYZ, doing that through the lens of different global cultures and how cultures relate to change, which I think there are some lovely overlaps with um, different kinds of diversity in terms of like how we see change, how we, how we think about change, how we talk about it, all of that. Um, I am absolutely convinced at this point that every single individual, every single organization, and every single culture on the planet struggles with change, um, not necessarily in the same way, but we've all developed unique ways of dealing with it, and there's a ton we can learn from one another. So um, that's what I've been up to. Uh, I could talk about this the whole session. I think one interesting thing maybe I'll, I'll bring up that I'd love to, you know, it feels to me aligned with OGM is that um, so much of how we relate to change boils down to our mindset and you know our from the understanding change from the inside out and we spend so much time um, I think as individuals but largely as organizations as well uh, focusing on change management and um, you know change strategy and developing a strategy to, to deal with it and we don't actually spend time first understanding where our relationship to change is grounded. So for example, are you coming at change from a place of hope or fear? Depending on how you answer that question, you will develop a different strategy. You will seek to manage change differently. Yet no one talks or very few people talk about the mindset piece that sort of we end up putting the cart before the horse. So um, I offer that just as one thing to kind of noodle on. And uh, yeah, my book launches in August. So I am completely focused on, um, I hate to say it, publicity and outreach and that sort of thing. But um, for anyone who's published a book, I think you, you understand. I knew that it was going to be a heavy lift after the writing. I now think I will probably spend at least three times as much 
energy and effort on actually <laughs> getting the book into the world as I did writing it. But um, that's what's up. I'm happy to be back with you all. And um, I will be in listen and learn and observe mode today. So um, thank you, Jerry. I put a link to April's book in the chat. And also I mapped the eight superpowers in my brain. And I put a link to that in the chat. And one of the superpowers is called Know You're Enough, which I think is really relevant here in part two. I just want to add it to what I was saying earlier about having personal conversations and figuring out how to, how to bridge that divide. And one of my amateur beliefs is that um, a lot of the people of privilege see these coming movements of social justice and whatever you want to call it, even poverty alleviation, as personal loss. All they see from all these sorts of things. And, it, and it's a little bit like when Ma Bell is broken up, their, Ma, Ma Bell's market share, because it's a legal monopolist, can only go from 100% down because it's been broken up and, and now you know, everybody's going to have less share. So for somebody who's used to being in control mm -hmm. and having power and having privilege and having access and having inexpensive everything and having people pay attention to them, every motion toward equality feels like loss. And so having them know they're enough and having them know when they have enough, what, do you, what that even means. And there's this whole notion of a billionaire tax that Elizabeth Warren has proposed that's sort of in, uh, under consideration, a bunch of things like that. But, but how, and we're busy in the middle of this set of ideas that have eaten our brains that greed is good, accumulation is what it's all about, that the wealthiest person is somehow the one we should bow to and has the most status, all of those kinds of things. And, and we need to kind of undermine, I think, uh, a lot of those common notions of, of status and all that. Let me pass it to Scott who has his hands up. Um, quick question for April. <clears throat> so in your book writing, I've been exploring this idea and, and I'd like to understand what happened for you. Were you writing to share or teach something you already knew or were you writing to learn and explore to understand something that you didn't quite know yet? What a wonderful question, Scott. Um, thank you. And, uh, and then I have a footnote to add on what Jerry said about enough. So um, I, in, now that it's written, I, 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 I mean, I, I guess I would say it was both. It wasn't one or the other. Um, I've shared with a few of you, um, I spent more than 20 years of people saying, hey, April, when are you going to write a book? Hey, when are you going to write a book? And they, most people thought it would be a travel book about, you know, April's adventures, whatever. And I was like, that is just not what the world needs. And I am not going to write a book <laughs> because other people think I need to write a book. But about five years ago, I began to feel like a book was coming out of me. And initially, I, I didn't know the form it would take. I didn't know exactly how the dots would connect. But what I can say now is that I had, I had, I guess you could say, lived long enough or been thinking hard enough about a set of issues in which I could feel that a unique and helpful point of view was emerging. So insofar as there was something that I had to offer to others, I began to feel that coming out. And what was interesting for me is it wasn't forced or prompted or wasn't something I had to do. I just felt like, well, I guess you could say my gut started to feel like I couldn't not do it. And, uh, and I don't want to get too morbid here, but I have told Jerry, you know, if anything happens to me in the next five months, just make sure that book gets published. Because there's a piece of it that's kind of like a love letter. Um, that's not the right phrase, but like everything that I know and care about, by and large, in some way, shape or form, shows up in this book. And I know that not all books are that way. So I'm really grateful that mine ended up containing so much of what I have digested and noodled over and, and, and can provide, I think, in a unique and refreshing way. That said, I was very aware that, I mean, I can even say now, if I were to write the book this month or next year, it would be a different, probably better book because of what I've learned. There's this inevitable learning process, not just about writing itself, but like everything you learn leads to something else. And I mean, it got to the point, Jerry saw it firsthand. I just had to like, and my editor in particular, where he's like, we have to cut the, we have to toe the line. Like you can't keep learning. You, you can't keep bringing more to the table because this book will never get done. 
so inherent in that is a learning process um, and also, you know, a clear acknowledgement that I think this book could have multiple iterations. I think it could lead to like a series of books and obviously the concept of flux, it's universal. It's also scale free, right? We can talk about tiny macro micro changes in your daily life. We can talk about big macro changes, things in flux um, in the world, be that consumerism or climate or whatever else. So um, it lends itself to a lot of different angles and sort of an infinite ability or an infinite degree of, of research. Um, just real briefly, Jerry, I was gonna add a footnote on the enough stuff, just as a fun aside, so that the title of that superpower is Know Your Enough, Y-O-U-R. And that relates to what is your enough? What is your point of sufficiency? What is what does enough mean um, on many different um, scales? And uh, how many people have called me and said, oh, that's a typo. It needs to say, no, you're enough. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, which is a fascinating interplay. And I think knowing you are enough, just as you are, and you don't need more, and you don't need, you know, all of these external trappings and things that society tell us dictate our wealth and value to society. You do need to know you are enough in or it's a piece of knowing you're bigger enough, but the bigger enough is also related to physical possessions, money, all that other stuff. So I bring that up because I've been taken aback by how many people, even the, the, the phrase know you're enough, they don't see that. They, 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 their brain kind of does this head fake and they're like, it's a typo. So kind of fun. Thanks. And we've been riffing on the title in the Mattermost chat a little bit, just playing with it just a little bit. Um, Pete Julian Gill. Uh, good morning, all. Um, and um, April, I want to kind of echo that that three times the marketing effort than the, the writing of the book. I've it, it took me a long time, but I think that's true of uh, software development, technology development in general. Um, uh, technologists have this thing where so software developers, it's like, oh, it's only going to take me, you know, uh, this amount of effort to write the thing. And it's like, if you if you can't figure out how to, software developers, I don't think can market either. So I, I think you're doing a wonderful job, April. And you can you're you're a pro. Software developers are not, and they don't know how to do it. So they have to find somebody or find some process to help them with. You know, it was a lot of effort to build this thing, but to get it out in the world and get people using it is a much bigger effort than even building the thing. Um, this week has been super generative. Uh, the steering team had an amazing call uh, on Tuesday, um, and we 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 jumped over a couple of hurdles um, and broke through some some amazing barriers. Uh, there's more stuff going on um, that we need to to continue, we, we need we need more work, but um, uh, we've made progress going along uh, down the Lionsburg um, uh, partnership, maybe is, is a good way to, to frame it. Um, uh, I spoke briefly last week about Massive Wiki. Um, Massive Wiki is an effort that is not quite ready to, it, it's not friendly yet. <laughs> um, it's still um, developer, developer geekiness that we're working through, but um, I'm really heartened by it and it's going well. Um, the FJB call, um, FJB team had a, a really good, uh, another, you know, very productive um, uh, generative friction kind of call um, about uh, whether Massive Wiki even makes sense or whether it should be bigger or different or things like that. And so I, I was really happy about that team being able to do that work. Um, and then kind of in the more direct and tactical um, thing with Massive Wiki, uh, Bill Anderson has been a huge help um, in kind of just chewing through the, the stuff that's only developer friendly right now. Um, so I feel like that whole thing is going really well, even though I, I can't really report out much or invite folks who um, don't want to play with sharp computer edges. Um, uh, Tomorrow also is Flotilla Friday. Uh, we've got a call at 9 a.m. Um, Pacific noon Eastern, and it's kind of a um, it's kind of a standing call. We've we're finally getting kind of maybe into the rhythm of it. Um, it's Vincent and Pete and whoever else talking about directories and matchmaking, 
um, in a technical sense, matchmaking um, and uh, shared calendars and things like that. So you're welcome to join. Uh, there's more deets uh, in the Flotilla uh, channel on Mattermost. Pete, can you just say what time it is? The call? Uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon uh, Eastern. Thank you. And I think that's for CET, but don't quote you me without. That one more time, Pete. Sorry. 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, noon Eastern. OK, thank you. Um, and um, a big shout out to uh, some of the, that uh, Jerry and I were working with, and uh, probably a number of us know. Dave Witzel, it's awesome to see you on the call. Uh, welcome, and, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, cool. That's it for me. Um, thank you very much, Pete. That was awesome. Uh, Julian Gill Vincent. Since the last week, I've been focusing on beefing up my importers so that I have this triumvirate from the brain to Neo4j to my 3D visualizer getting a lot more solid. Mark sent me one of his climate brains a few days ago, and uh, it's been fun working with that because the massive jump and load to something real and heavy uh, helped me get rid of a lot of software issues. So the issue now is to continue making those solid, uh, take that knowledge back to working with the SIGGRAPH history database. And then it's actually at the point where something useful could be done. It's like there's all this data sitting there now in the knowledge base and real analysis could be done. So during the next week, I want to push towards getting some actual uh, work done with this, with this knowledge base. And for context for everybody, Julian is working with 3D visualizations of information clouds, in particular SIGGRAPH, which is a special interest group on graphics of the ACM, which is the Association for Computing Machinery. Correct me if I'm wrong on all that, all those acronyms. But it's, it's like you have to unpack the acronyms just to get to, to describe what's going on here. Uh, and yeah. he's also importing brain files to figure out what does the 3D visualization of the brain actually look like and making progress. It would be nice if someday, uh, as I've mentioned before, if things that you do in the 3D knowledge management tool could be fed back into the brain, but that's not likely. Like the changes you make can be fed back into a Neo4j version of the brain, uh, but then you're no longer connected to the brain. Yep. Um, I was, go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention, that speaking of acronyms, very often, especially in computer science, you run into squared acronyms, right, where there's an acronym and each one of those is an acronym. And it's been one of my life's quests to look for cubed acronyms. Ooh. Uh, Pete, know of any? I'm, I'm sure Pete's going to find a cubed acronym. I'm just, don't know. I'm just a guess here. Um, and I attended one SIGGRAPH. I don't remember what year it was. Let's pretend 1992 or something like that. And I remember seeing two things from uh, at that thing. One of them was called Mandala. And it, it later we see it as Microsoft Connect. But basically, I, I stood in front of a camera and a green screen. And by reaching out, I could play musical instruments. And they were, they were sort of, uh, they were uh, tubes, what do you call them, uh, hanging from the ceiling. And I could run my hand across yeah. them and they made noise. Uh, then there were drums in front of me and it was all pretty real time. They had a sun server or something like that under the counter. Um, and I was like, this is really, and then you could tap a button on the screen and it would flip to a different background and you, and everything would be animated differently. And I was like, this is, this is really, really cool. It's going to turn into something. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that would show up at the, at the conferences. If everybody remembers the, those days of when we actually showed up in person at conferences, um, seems like a long, long time ago. Uh, Gil Vincent Judy. Yeah. Um, wow. So much. Uh, April, wonderful to see you here. Congratulations on the book. Um, I'm eager, very eager. Uh, I'm reminded a dear friend of mine used to always love reminding me back in the day that Huey Newton, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, used to say, flux, flux, all is flux. So I think of that whenever I see the title here. Um, um, yeah, generativity. Um, I'm, I'm living in the challenge of how to funnel all that is alive and exploding inside you through one single physical body in a 28 hour day. Uh, so there's that challenge. And also, um, you know, uh, tr uh, exploring how to reorient to the explosion of platforms that are surrounding us and, you know, how to find time to be in the conversations I want to be in and also do the work that I want to do. Um, specifically, I'm hungry to write. Um, April, thank you for the reminder and inspiration. Uh, I'm, I'm, I found that I've, um, 
I've habituated to very short form writing, living on you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters and so forth. And I used to write longer stuff and I'm finding it hard to do that. So what I've started to do is, is to um, archive most everything interesting that I'm doing on Twitter and Facebook and sticking in a file that I can use for the longer pieces on the books that are to come. Um, in terms of creative activity right now, I'm focused in particular, oh, I'm, 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 I'm finally back in the saddle. I'm building out the turnaround funds that I've been wanting to build for a number of years. So it's slow going between everything else, but feels like it's back on. I found the chief investment officer who I really like uh, and a scheme. Um, very challenged by turning my whole system's brain into a single defined thing that an investor can invest in because investors seem to like very specific plays, not multi-layered integrative OGM kind of plays. And I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise if any of you have some thoughts on that. Um, and uh, second to that, um, working slowly on building out an academy, a, a leadership academy around loosely sustainability, but more specifically a deeper approach to how we live in this world. And that brings me back to a thank you to, I'm gonna find faces on the screen here, to Hank. Um, I really appreciated what you had to say, Hank, about understanding and such. And I've been, uh, I've been reflecting deeply on those kinds of questions. And um, when, when I consider that um, most, if not all of our experience in the world is constructed, um, you know, what we call reality is, is, a, is an interpretation assembled by this, this, this physical being given its neurology and chemistry and so forth. Um, and so all of our experience and all of our thought forms and all that we say to each other is interpretations of, you know, of, of our experience, uh, interpretations upon interpretations, interpretations all the way down. And then we have the layer of, of not just mine, mine but yours. Um, and so at a certain, from a certain perspective, we can't possibly understand each other because um, we don't have the shared experience. We have the different histories and historicities and tribes and uh, whatnot. Um, and um, I'm coming to wonder whether we even understand what understanding means. So there's a whole bunch of tangled loops there, but the, but the beauty and mystery of the life that we live is attempting to understand each other, even though we can't. It's attempting to connect across the ultimate mystery of what it means to be a human being. And I find that uh, strange and challenging and beautiful. Um, we have to live as if we do understand each other. We have to live as though our experience are, 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 are similar enough to function in the world, and yet not, and yet yes. And yet so there, um, in that you know, sort of strange tension, um, between um, those two seemingly incompatible views of humanity and reality that I think, I think give rise to something fascinating and beautiful. And that's the first time I've said that story out loud. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Gil. Matt, go ahead. You know, Gil, that's, um, it reminds me of, of a thought that I was exploring many, many, many years ago after reading um, um, a book by Milan Kundera, right? That there's this, there's this notion of words misunderstood. And, you know, if, if, if our communication was perfect, then what you knew in your mind and what I knew in my mind would just sort of be additive. And it's actually in, in the deviation of that understanding that there's a gap that's formed. And it's in that gap where actually co-creation happens, right? Because that's the space between understanding where we can create new understanding. And, and part of the problem that I'm noticing in the world today is our patience for that gap is narrowing. And if you can hold Right, open-mindedness, at least as I understand this, if you can hold a gap that's really, really wide, 
where you can live together in that common sense making of not only what someone else is saying, but also what you're saying, right? That we're talking about the process of writing as a process of making sense of our tacit knowledge as well, that, that that's where there's real human potential. Um, and I think that, you know, what you're saying is just, it, it, um, it reminds me of this sort of really profound, you know, place of that the beauty is actually in not understanding and, and the figuring and the letting go of what we think we know to move into the next thing that we think we know, to move into the next thing that we think we know. So I just really appreciate, appreciate that. And I'm, I'm grateful to be reminded of something that I thought of many years ago that I maybe lost um, because I didn't have my brain operating um, the way it should be. Matt, 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 thank you for that. I have no idea how to put this into my brain, but thank you for that, and for uh, and thank you, Milan Kundera, also for it. You know, the what you're saying about about the gap in the space and the gap is is one of the reasons that I'm so um, concerned slash skeptical about AI. Mm -hmm. Correct. The whole design of that, the way we do it now, at least, is to eliminate the gap, and that's I think a wrong direction. Um, certainly for things that want to be human-like, because human-like is, is living in the gap. Um, and I would just tweak one thing you said. You said about the things that, I, that you know in your brain and that I know in my brain. But that's, that's an information theory of living systems. Yeah. And it's not about information in my brain. It's about the electrochemically embodied experience in my body, of which my brain is a part for sure, an important part, but there's something, there's something far beyond the notion of, you know, neurological brains and data into, uh, into a fields within fields, uh, constantly evolving into, I mean, look, we are right now changing each other's neurobiology yes. in real time, all the time. Uh, and so that's, you know, standing from You've that- You've exposed the secret great, of the calls. Exactly. You've exposed the secret of the OGM calls, damn it. It's only, it's only members here, Jerry, so it's cool. Oh, okay, good. Whew. Oh, and, and off, offline, maybe I'd love to know what is the protocol for inviting new people into this conversation? Because there's a couple of them I think would be very enriched by it. And rich I, I basically, um, point, easiest way is point them to the OGM okay. site and they can join <laughs> there or well. point them to me. Sorry, keep going. Very good. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for that. Thank you for that adjustment. And I think, you know, that again, reminds me of the conversation of not open global brain, but open global mind that and mind me. is mindfulness and, and it's beyond the, it's beyond the, the knowledge it's, it's in the, it's in the embodiment of our experiences. So thank you. That was great. Thank you for that adjustment. Um, that and as Greg Mason would say, not only is it not only here, but here, it's here. The mind is, mm -hmm. a, is, a, is a shared phenomenon. There's yeah. no my mind, there's our, there's mind. Right. So several, before passing the mic to Eric and Doug, who I see both, um, a couple of things. One, this conversation, although it is a philosophical rabbit hole we could chase forever, is a very deep OGM topic and really matters to us. And every time we have it, it's lovely because we're sort of vibing on how do we talk about this? How do we come together, whatever? And uh, I was just thinking about the complexification and Ken posted the article by Adam Grant uh, about Adam Grant's new book. And he says, hey, uh, binary arguments are lose-lose. Like you're never gonna win a binary argument because it forces people to pick a camp. Uh, one way to get through this is to pick through the different ways and, and you'll discover that even people who see, apparently disagree in a binary way will agree on a variety of things as you unpack the complexity of issues, which I really like because that's part of what I'm trying to do when I map other people's arguments in my brain. I'm trying to get down to uh, the roots and I'll, I'll find some of that and share it in the, in the chat. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a whole lot here. Uh, off to Eric and then Doug. Yeah, I think uh, one of the main things I wanted to share on it is like, how difficult for me it is when people try to make experiences the same. I often noticed it in workshops or in thinking of like oneness or uh, non-dualism, non-duality. Uh, there's, there's this tendency of wanting to see, yeah, we're all the same. We all carry the same experience. And it often feels really painful to me because it, it's both. There is a similarity and we share this kind of 
deep sense of unity. There's moments where that's really, really beautiful. But I've also noticed that the uniqueness of us actually makes us also beautiful. And diversity is also the uniqueness of being different and that it actually is the richness of life itself. Um, yeah, I think that's one part of what I wanted to say, but I want to keep it brief, so I'll keep it at that. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I want to build on what Gil was talking about. I think it's really important that we keep pushing on understanding how the brain connects to other people, given that you know our senses really connect us to 10 or 30 feet in front of us, and that's it. And yet we imagine that we live in a whole world. It's pretty amazing. I wanted to cut in here because I just finished reading a book that I found extremely helpful in this regard. The title is Paleolithic Politics by Barry Cooper. And the book is brilliant and beautifully written. And it, it's a movement into the mind of Stone Age people that's just extraordinary in its uh, uh, depth and its the quality of feeling. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. I have another thing I want to put into my uh, morning ritual here. What do we get to say, but I'm going to do it now. Uh, a few days ago, I got a call from a group of people that I worked with in the early uh, first Clinton administration who have been in the Office of Management of Budget and many other federal things. There are four of them with extreme experience in federal government. And they want to start an initiative on reinventing government. Uh, and this group is extremely sophisticated, extremely experienced, extremely friendly minded, and anything but bureaucratic in their sense of the world. And so I'm thinking about it. it, it it's kind of a raw seed. And we had a first meeting yesterday. And basically their intent is really clear. Their goals are clear but they have no method. And so I'm thinking, is it possible to somehow bring it into OGM? Uh, and I worry about that because uh, the, this group is extremely sophisticated and knowledgeable and experienced in so many ways. But anyway, it's on my mind. I'm, I'm running it around trying to figure out how this might work. At the moment, it's a, it's a seed. And I was struck after, uh, I mean, we're going back to 1992 and three, uh, that this group called me up based on what we had done then and want to continue. And it was an amazing experience just being pulled back into the past or pulling the past into the present, so. Doug, thank you. And if you like, we could set up just a one-off Zoom call at their time convenience. Uh, and just bring a, put, put the invite on OGM, see who shows up and just have a peaceful conversation there. Because I'm, I'm fearing what may be going through the back of your mind is like, if we just add them to the OGM Google group, they will be overwhelmed and like, what the hell is this? Which I can completely empathize with. Um, so maybe that or, so, or somebody else has a, a, another idea for a sort of a gentle introduction for, for how to do this. Um, cool, that, let's go back to the queue. Vincent, Judy, Dave. Hi, everyone. This is Vincent. Um, so now that we're on the topic of knowledge and, and books, I thought I'd just share. Um, so my freshman year, I took my first semester, a one credit course called How to Change the World. And the professor's name was Bert Swersey. He was a um, ex-engineer, inventor, um, had written like and filed like seven pat patents for different medical devices. Um, he was an entrepreneur and he ended up um, founding one of the first like medical scale uh, companies um, that went public. Um, and he then um, ended up going into teaching at RPI and he taught these classes, um, how to change the world and inventor studio, which was a senior capstone on creativity and on teaching engineering students to think differently, to think really big. And um, his class was really what like changed my entire trajectory of, of my life. I, I 
after his course switched from just doing engineering to studying design innovation society, which is more focused on like problem solving and environmental and social issues. Um, and he ended up passing away uh, my sophomore year um, while I was actually TAing for him. And he had started a book. And so um, it's a really interesting story. Um, a few of his teacher's assistants and family members basically took his transcripts and picked that up and ran with it. And we're working, we're now approaching the sixth anniversary of his passing and we're almost ready to launch a Kickstarter for um, a, basically a prototype of the book called Don't Do Nonsense, uh, Make the World Better for a Billion People. And it's a creative workbook. And we wanted to capture the kind of essence of his class, which really was, if I could describe him in like, in, in one sentence, like he got, he got all the students, freshmen to stand up on the desks and scream, this is unacceptable and like bang our fists and yell in the middle of an engineering course in the classroom. Um, after we had watched a video about uh, <laughs> climate change and basically just got everyone really fired up that like we were the ones who had to be responsible for solving these problems. And um, so yeah, that definitely resonated with a lot of people. And um, it's been really interesting now going back and like, um, as we're writing this and it's a kind of like a collaborative process, uh, like I feel like the world has changed so much in six years. Cause like there's stuff in here that like six years ago made so much sense. And a lot of it is, is very relevant, but I also feel like the world has become so much more complex that I almost feel like it needs to go further. And I think that's why it's like so hard to finish this. It feels like it can never be finished. Um, but yeah, um, definitely uh, with April's point about like kind of uh, just shutting out all the new information and kind of just focusing on definitely feeling that uh, desire at the moment. So um, yeah, thanks for kind of bringing that up. Vincent, thank you. And because you'd mentioned it before, I put a, a link to Bert in the chat and Pete has been doing research on the things you just mentioned and putting them in the Mattermost chat. So um, there's a nice rich, uh, rich trove of things there. And April just posted her cover art on the chat, which is awesome. Uh, her cover is final. And if you go to Amazon, there's actually a picture of, and, and like the book isn't available on bookshelves until August. So interesting. Uh, let's, and I've lost my cue because it just bounced up. Judy, Dave, Eric. Thank you. I'm excited to be working right now on kind of the world flux because what I'm endeavoring to do is take what we do here to as many different local communities as I can. And then within those communities, trying to identify with them their, their, their zones of real interest. And so I'm really interested in specifically the flux piece because all of us are in continual flux and stress to some degree. Um, when I was thinking earlier, I wanted to really comment on the notion of oneness also in terms of oneness with all, oneness with other people, oneness with the planet and so forth, because I think that's another piece of the vital connection that will help all of us be more effective, more comfortable, um, the spiritual piece, however you choose to pursue it, and the sense of belonging to something that's much bigger than whatever is hitting you in the face today or tomorrow or this week. So I'm, I'm excited that there's some momentum I think that's available. And just last night we did a sort of, it wasn't an OGM call, but we used the protocol of OGM to have what we call the meetup of a group of people that are interested in science and supporting science. There was so much energy. It was just astonishing. Um, it was a combination of you know, short comments by people, a couple kickoff speakers for three minutes, five minutes, and then dialogue with groups. And because it was a group about 20, we split them into three group rooms and then moved people around. So we were playing with the model, but the energy of that hour was just phenomenal. And so I'm really excited about the ability to take this to many different settings. Love that, Judy. Thank you. Um, 
I love also how, how things are propagating through you dendritically, one could even say metaphorically. Um, so let's go, oops, I lost my cue. Uh, Dave Eric Lauren. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for including me. I don't get to uh, come to these very often. So I've got a conflicting meeting, which was canceled today, and then Jerry's email showed up. It was like, whoa, what a great update. So uh, serendipity. Um, I am spending most of my time working on something called the Global Regeneration Collab. Um, hey, this is something that got spun up by David Hodgson uh, a little over a year ago. And it's, you know, one of these, uh, we're caught talking about it as a maker space for regenerative change makers. Uh, so trying to create, um, you know, enhanced capacity amongst the folks who are going to create the regenerative future, I guess is the way to, to say it. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I'm kind of involved in community management in a way I haven't really done before, which is both enlightening and a pain in the butt. And I uh, feel like I'm learning a lot of things about, you know, Ken and I and Gil a little bit, we're talking about the difference between systems thinking and systems doing. So I feel like I'm running into that wall a little bit. Um, so uh, it's, been, it's been pretty enjoyable. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about what the collab is doing? Because it's been 400 years since I've talked with Hodgson. I need to reconnect with him. This feels like a very OGME community that, that we should sort of build a bridge between. And I'm interested in the kinds of things that, that y'all are doing in the collab that feel resonant here. That sounds great. Yeah, I actually agree a lot. I can, I can, I'll stick a, a link into the uh, chat to kind of a, the introductory PowerPoint that we've been using, which is probably the best overview we've got. But um, it is, uh, you know, it's a group of peer to peer. It's, it's the idea is peer to peer advising. We've got some pretty pretty good facilitators uh, involved in coordination, and we're using some sociocracy to kind of do management, uh, which I actually think both of those are kind of new technologies that are going to change in the game a little bit. Uh, and then focusing around this idea of regeneration, um, so that it's kind of a north star around that um, chunk of people involved in agriculture in particular, but really a variety, wide variety of folks: new currencies, economics, uh, urban design. And it turns out one of the things that people are focused on, like, you know, from my technocratic hat, I've been surprised by, is uh, uh, kind of inner transformation. Like, how do, you, how do you deal with the inner regeneration before we do outer regeneration? I'm like, can we just skip that whole step and just get to the thing? But um, yeah, April, I figured you'd be, you'd yeah. be reading in on that one pretty clearly. Um, so, you know, and then practically, it's, it's, uh, we're doing lots and lots of Zoom meetings. We did 354 Zoom meetings last year. Whoa. Um, and um, and Slack, you know, forty thousand plus Slack members. Um, but one of the one of the things is that to me, it's like the, there is energy in the community, and it is kind of uh, self organizing, which is you know kind of unusual, I think, from what I've seen in a lot of these communities going back many years now. So it's exciting to see to see the energy and to see the the motivation. Um, and then we've actually seen like initiatives kind of growing out of it and businesses forming and new partnerships and fundraising being done and kind of things that would indicate the growth of that next stage. So it's a little bit encouraging that you can't actually, we're talking about creating healthy, healthy soil from which regenerative initiatives will sprout. Um, and we're actually seeing some sprouts. So that's kind of fun. Thanks. Yeah, David. Love that. Th I was going to, Klaus, I was going to say, you should probably talk to Dave. <laughs> oh, and Klaus has been playing some. It's good to see you. Oh, good. I've seen you oh, in some other groups. No, David actually invited me to this group, which I wasn't aware of. And um, what it really pointed out is the need to find an umbrella, you know, to, to connect, because there's so many parallel efforts that would be so much more powerful if we combine them. And in particular, uh, at this time, we need to engage the political process, right? Because they're in the middle of making massive changes in the Department of Agriculture and USDA, and it will impact the agricultural sector. And it's just very important to be at the table at this time. Um, and I just want to point out that we're one of the things we're doing on the side is trying to figure out how to explain OGM, what are OGM superpowers or secret sauce. And one thing that we're not doing really yet that we just mentioned here is bridge building across organizations, across a movement, not to homogenize them or unify them, but rather to link them up and turbocharge them. 
And I'd love to have anybody's ideas on what that means to you, how to implement it, how do we articulate it, all those kinds of things. Because I think that, that there's a, I, I see OGM as pretty meta. We're not out to find the best solution to climate change mitigation. We're out to map all the groups that are doing great work on climate change mitigation, help them connect, help share out what they know, help evolve those arguments to convince more people that it matters, things of that nature. But it's, it's we're sort of, uh, as, as my imagination of this goes, we're kind of meta trying to build the bridges and the connections. So any, any insights on that are extremely welcome as we figure out what this is. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, we are, we are moving into a prototyping phase. Uh, collectively, really, it's happening everywhere. Now, in order to prototype a project, you have to have input from all uh, as from all sides. You know, a 360 input, and to organize that uh, is probably the single most important next step. You know, to bring these available resources together and set up a prototype project somewhere in a community level, uh, and then and then map this out and make it uh, reproducible. Thank you. And Jerry, and there, I mean, this is back to the, the systems doing thing. I mean, I feel like we actually, there are some things happening that are in this realm. Um, I mean, one is, you know, just the, the, the Slack ability to join two different Slacks at a channel. So we've got a couple of like the, with the, the Permaculture Collab and GRC are sharing a channel, which is around the platform design stuff, uh, Pete. So, you know, the idea is that could we have some kind of, what does it mean to have a shared platform? So that conversation is going on. And then we're kind of trying to deliberately do uh, what sociocracy calls a double linking, where you have people like people from across the networks joining each other's network, and then using that as the kind of connection. So it's like the you know, um, so that's one of the reasons I was joining uh, Chica Chat. Uh, uh, Lauren was to try to try to double link a little bit, and we've been doing that with you know the Regen network and other groups as well. Of course, everybody's on a different server. You know, you guys are on. What is this matter mattermost matter most, region yeah. checks on discord we're on slack and a bunch of people are on mighty you know so it's, it's fascinating and then the, the other one that we've been playing with that i'd love to to try more is just kind of signing mous like there's a, we have a strategic partnership with you and all it really means is we agree right we're going to support each other we know about you we support each other there's no other obligation kind of but it feels like that statement, you know, would be a, would be useful. So anyway, I would love to hear more ideas for how to actually do that. But I, I agree, Klaus, that it's really important. And I think we can do things and we have some things that are underway. Love that. Um, thank you. Back to our queue, Eric, Lauren, Matt. Yeah, everyone. Um, yeah, I've been thinking of what I wanted to say. I, um, just a moment. I. I wanted to share a video, that's one thing, and it started when I looked it up. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a weird effect. Um, I'll share it now. So this is um, a, a video, it's like a mixture of one part is like a video uh, and my own edit from a video that I made with a illustrator, photographer, film, videographer. And the second part is uh, brainstorm sessions, which I also put into a kind of collage. Uh, when I was dancing and I was dancing when uh, it was like 15 years ago and it's also when my project started and I, um, I'm i kind of thinking like how to approach my life right now. Um, I've been having talks with Vincent um, and I noticed what he's doing is really close to what I want to do and um, and he's moving forward really quickly and I'm for me I'm going really slow and I'm also dealing with mental health issues, um, dealing with trying to find stability, trying to find a new place to live, uh, so many open loops. And I shared this video, I think, because it kind of expresses also how I felt at that time and I still do now. It's like dealing with all this complexity, there's no still point. It seems like to have this space where everything keeps on challenging me. And it's kind of my brain, but it's also the way that my life is kind of structured around me, it seems. <laughs> and part of me is saying, yeah, just take your time for yourself. And it's really difficult for me to do that um, because another part of me wants to move forward. And, um, and I, 
this video is called light play dark play because it's also expressing this kind of thing in me like I, I felt the deepest sense of wonder and the deepest sense of happiness in my life but i've also uh, dealt with the most challenging issues somehow um and i i think a lot of people in this group have had different levels of uh crisis and mental health issues and stuff like that in their lives and also related to dealing with this complexity and in two hours i will start a course on active hope uh that's like uh, john macy's work and facing the dark and for me a lot of it is also like just how my um how the outer world issues also affect my inner world issues and how it affects how i believe in the world how i believe in my own life and i'm really like searching really deeply how do i do this and how do I step away from this kind of weird dynamics in my life where, um, yeah, just how do, I, how do I get into a groove that this will evolve and that I can get my money to what I really want to do and not trying to search all the time for this kind of job that I might do next to my projects. And it's just way too much, all of it. Um, yeah. There, there's plenty more there that I could say, but I wanted to be open about it and honest because I also would like to find a place where we could support each other and, and find support on that level where it's the deepest and the most difficult. Yeah. So yeah, that's my sharing, I guess. Um, I'd like us just to go in the silence to hold what you've just given us, which mm -hmm. is lovely. I'll bring us back up. Thank you, Eric. Um, if anybody would like to offer something back to Eric, there's no need for that, but um, cool. Uh, Eric, I think that you, you're right. A lot of us are on very parallel quests to yours, and a lot of us have hit lots of road bumps and blocks in our journeys and are trying to wrestle through how to do that. And a lot of us could really use pulling with each other and helping each other uh, through this. So um, thank you for putting that on the table that way. And I think we need to spend more time on the question you just put in front of us. Like, how do we do that for each other? So. Thank you. I, I do want to offer something back to Eric. Um, and it touches back on something April was talking about earlier. When I was 50, I went into a very deep depression. Um, I had a wonderful 50th birthday. And the next day, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I had just left a 10 years of, of work that um, I didn't know where I, what I was where I was going to go. And I was depressed for an entire year. I lost 40 pounds. I wasn't eating. Um, it was really hard. People thought I had gotten really sick because I was so skinny. And um, I didn't have any energy to do anything. I, you know, I didn't go out, didn't talk to friends. Um, and the day after my 51st birthday, I woke up and I have this voice that appears in my my life now and then. It rarely speaks more than a few words, and I can actually physically locate it. It's it's behind and up to the left, and and these words came into my head on my fifth, the day after my fifty first birthday, and they said, "What if I'm actually enough?" And during that depression, I was living with, "I'm not enough. I can't. I don't know what to do with this world. I have a bunch of shit I don't want. I don't have a lot of stuff I do want." And it just feels like, what the fuck have I done? You know, I'm 50 years old and I, I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing. And that little shift of what if I'm enough allowed me to come back into the world of saying, I'm not enough for the whole world, but I'm enough for my life. And so I just want to offer to you that, you know, I see you here and you're enough to be here and you're enough for our lives. 
Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Ken, I'd like to offer, and Eric, I know we've just met. Um, I'm really happy to meet you, and, and I will not profess to have the answer, but um, this is one of those moments, and this is not about my books, but there, so much of what you've talked about was one of the, like, when I was, for the last 25 plus years, like, been looking around saying, this, like, even the world today, it's not working for a lot of people. And it goes beyond, I think, systemic, there is clearly systemic injustices and stuff like that. It's this, it's this, whose life are we living? Who's, and the way that I've put it, and this is all spelled out in the introduction, which I'm happy to share with you guys now as a PDF, but whatever. Um, I, I term it in, in I, I phrase it in terms of script. And like each and every one of us is living a script a life that's been scripted, um, whether or not we know it. And, you know, one script is not better than the other. We all have our scripts. And I think it's the kind of like norms and rules and the way we're socialized. But it's also, I think, the promise of the world we're told we'll live in if we follow these certain rules. And I feel like what's happening more and more is as we grow up and we see the younger you go, the more you find it of people saying, the world I'm inhabiting is not at all the world I was promised I would, I would get to if I followed the rules. And now we're in this really interesting space and we can call it a bardo or the liminal space, lots of different things. But like, it's, it's like we're stuck between two branches on two different trees and we're trying to swing from one branch to the other. And the tree that we've been on is this old script where more is better. Your career is about getting a job and climbing a ladder. Uh, people are not to be trusted. Uh, you know, there are lots of overlaps and, and each of these links with a different superpower. That's an aside. And I'm looking at this saying, we are, all, all, you and, and I think many people in their own ways are recognizing that this old script is really, really out broken. It's outdated. It's no longer fit for purpose. But as Jerry likes to say, it has a really long tail. So we recognize that we need to get to this new place of writing a new script in which you are the author of your script, not someone else, not society. And each of us is the author of our own script, but we're stuck in that we're still filtering a lot of decisions through this old script. And it's still what largely society is stuck in, but more and more people are saying, I need to write my own script. I need to be the author of my own life and, and my life needs to fit together differently. And it's really hard, I think, to be in the early stages of that because there aren't that many examples or data points to, to point to. But on the one hand, I just want to underscore, like you're not, you're so not alone in terms of this feeling of frustration. And I think a lot, a lot of people, more every day in their own way. I don't mean to say that, you're not, you're unique, but, but this sense of saying like, we need a new script and each of our scripts on this call will look and feel different. And part of what I've put forth in the book is for me, it's this notion of a flux mindset, which is in distinct contrast to, you know, there's the old script and the new script. There's the old mindset and the flux mindset. There is this, it's, it's a holistic shift in how we relate to change, but change on many different levels and this notion that it to, to echo Ken and to echo Dave that it really comes from the inside out and so I also want to applaud you for you're clearly working on this from the inside out and I wish more people were able to do that Thanks, yeah. April. go ahead Klaus. I would argue that my understanding of flux is that our journey is not a destination it's a journey you know, it's about the journey, not the destination. We can't define a destination to the point where uh, we are inviting uh, disappointment. And I'll just add maybe the obvious, which is this thing we're doing right now is, is the journey, which I love. Um, so let's go back to the queue for a second. Lauren, Matt, Klaus. Hey, everybody. April, it's so nice to see you. And uh, a big coucou to Capuchin. It's so nice to have you again. It's been a while. Um, 
And yeah, what an amazing conversation. Eric, thank you so much for just being vulnerable and sharing. And that was amazing. And um, it, David, it was so nice that you're talking about systems doing and MOUs. It's so fortuitous because um, next Monday, we're going to be trying to design uh, MOUs for our community to try to um, increase the uh, the grants that we can get and work together. So we're actually co-designing um, uh, MOUs next Monday um, to, to try to do this. We don't know exactly how to do it, but that's kind of the subject and we're gonna uh, work on this together. Um, so that's kind of a, it's like kind of a, a, a boring work thing, but it's the doing that kind of lays the foundation and then uh, after that, I kick a lab on, on Monday uh, at midnight, which is super late for me. But we have we have thirteen interns coming in, and ten of them are from Texas, and um, we're trying to onboard them, and we're not really sure how. And so we thought we'd have um, a sense making jam and experiment with our kind of. Uh, um, with just coming in and seeing how we can sense make on the fly around the, um, because I'm sure that, uh, you know, since they're from Texas, they've been kind of traumatized by the recent um, storm. So we thought we'd have the sense making jams um, around the, 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 the Texas disaster and seeing how, how we can come together to um, make sense of the situation and also show these um, uh, interns who are more like who are more like consultants because they're so um, competent. They're more competent than we ever imagined. So they're actually like PhDs and they're getting their MBAs. So they're <laughs> it's more than we thought we ever hoped for. So we're trying to lead them through that. And anyone who wants to come, so it's a midnight CT, which is what time is that uh, Pacific? 3, 3 so that's like 6 p.m. Um, no, Eastern. It's 3 p.m. 3 p.m. California time. And uh, I'll try to uh, um, post my Zoom in the that's where, that's where it's uh, taking place. So we're not we're not spending like hours and hours planning this. We're just gonna go in and do sense making on the fly. So did you say this is tomorrow, Lauren? No, no, no. This is next Monday, and that is the. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, Thursday, Monday, the eighth. So okay. at midnight, uh, mm -hmm. CET. 6 okay. p.m. So it's like at the night, the, it's our usual call, but at the end when it's it basically after work for the Texas people, because they, they're normal people who work like regular jobs, so. Thank you. Um, this is our cue and I'll point out that we're 15 minutes from the top from the half hour and several of us have to bounce to a different call to do some, some planning and some work for OGM. But if you're interested in the organization of OGM and the structure of it, you can join those calls. Just let me know and I'll, uh, I'll add you to the steering group uh, uh, conversations. We have regular calls uh, Tuesdays at the old time at 7 a.m. Pacific, which is a little early for some people, but, but we're busy trying to figure out how to put the handrails in place around OGM and how to get us structured as, a, as an entity and all of those kinds of things. And you're welcome to join us uh, on those calls. Uh, so let's go. And we're not going to make it through all these people because we don't have enough time, but Matt, Klaus, Scott. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll try to be really ef as efficient as I can. I got thousands of things on my brain and I guess that's what these, what going later in the, in the process. Um, the first thing is, um, I'll put it in the chat, but I've been reading the inheritance project, uh, project, uh, writing from the Atlantic. Um, it's really about, um, uh, black, uh, history and how we've, we it doesn't exist and it needs to be written um and so the inheritance project is doing some pretty amazing things um uh also in the same atlantic art uh, magazine that really introduced the inheritance project there was something about 
there was an article about how we um, we we somehow let go of the idea of a nervous breakdown, and a nervous breakdown is when you when you reach your limit, right? Um, when you reach uh, the end of your nerves and you need to let them rest and you need to go away. And we sort of professionalized it into, well, you have to get a, got to go see your doctor and you got to go get your pills versus, you know, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes Eric, you just need to take a break, um, a pause and rest and allow your nerves to rebuild. And there's been a lot of evidence in the article about people who, have done amazing things after they've given them themselves a chance to regenerate. And I love this idea of, you know, sort of regeneration, um, not only as a concept for, um, for the earth, but for all of us. And I think that there's a process of regeneration. Um, I'd also love to comment, you know, April on this, this, the paradigm of, you know, the old and, and the new and the swinging from sort of past scripts into future scripts. I, I wanna make sure um, kind of fitting into, um, you know, the comment about how intelligent our, and, and why some of our paleo, um, uh, paleolithic um, ancestors were that sometimes it's also about swinging to branches that used to exist that we have since, uh, let go of. Um, and we didn't realize that we were giving up, um, you know, things of beauty. And so how do we, um, regeneration is not just about the creation of the new, but sometimes it's about um, rebuilding the things that we've given up on. Um, I was down in Florida in the intercoastal driving a boat and you run into sandbars if you're not careful. Um, and they pop up all over the place. And if you're an idiot, you just kind of turn your motor on and you try to go forward. And all you do is get yourself further into the muck. Um, sometimes it's just about stepping back and, um, you know, kind of recalibrating where you are and where you want to go. So I'd sort of leave that there. On some very practical levels, I'm trying to build some OGME type things into a corporate client, it's proving difficult on two regards. One is getting them to, to sort of see the value of the complexity of what we're, we're trying to build and to trust that you can't just prototype aspects, but you really have to think systemically and build systemically, even if you're testing and learning. Related to that is on the other side is, you know, and um, a couple of people on this call as I was like, I'd love to introduce some of this thinking into that world. And I was um, caught off guard and surprised, but now humbled by the fact that people were like, not sure I actually wanna have that conversation. I'm not sure they're the ones who should benefit from the value of what we're creating here. And I found that to be, maybe that's a shorthand of what, what was said, but I found that to be a really both wise and provocative kind of stance. Um, and still trying to process what that, um, what that looks like. Um, and out of that conversation, uh, uh, there was sort of this notion um, that Vincent brought up that I've been ruminating on, which is if you want to decentralize power, you have to centralize coordination. Um, and I think that's to me what OGM is attempting to do is what is the operating system and the, 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 the ability to do, to have interoperability um, uh, enable um, kind of these decentralized um, uh, sovereign entities to come together in ways that actually amplify, you know, amplify value and allow all of us to take our experiences and, you know, create what's next. So that's my, um, those are my thoughts um, and thanks for your time. Um, thanks, Matt. Sorry, I was just typing in the chat. Uh, let's go, and we're not going to make it through everybody. Klaus Scott Craig. Yeah, I. Uh, oh, so many things. I uh, posted uh, a link to a conversation that happened yesterday from Berkeley. They have uh, the Edible Schoolyard Project, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, the most amazing thing about it is that it took place. It is the history of of how black farmers have been systematically disenfranchised by a white system. You know, and mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking 
to listen to, but it's also uh, uh, something that like uh, what Jerry was saying earlier, challenges white, uh, 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 the white class, you know, landowners and existing power structures. So to have these students um, um, do this research project is really uh, an, an amazing conversation that would have been impossible not too long ago. Um, I'm we're starting a new project um, with uh, the business climate leaders. I've been a member of the Citizen Climate Lobby, uh, uh, which is a political organization that is developing citizen lobbies, lobbyists. Now we have over 200,000 members. And I'm the sector leader agriculture here. I just put a link in. And the remarkable thing about this organization is that we, we are divided into sectors where you have retired executives basically leading these various sectors. And what I keep noticing is that the focus of business uh, is now shifting to where there is an acceptance that soil, that, that, that carbon sequestration is a must, right? So the, the science has advanced, the acceptance of science has advanced to the point that Yes, we, there is too much carbon in the atmosphere, it has to come out. But all of these conversations that you see in the electric, in the energy sector, in, in, in the conservative sectors and so on, is focused on mechanical ways of removing carbon out of the atmosphere. Billion dollar investments uh, to, to, to do that. And there is a, an avoidance of talking about soil or photosynthesis, as I define it, uh, as the only practical, ready to go to scale method to actually do that. So, so that's, that's uh, I'm, so, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of on this mission now to, to, to create a conversation within CCL and BCL, and I just got green lighted to do that, to, to uh, bring awareness to the, the physics, the laws of physics here that mean we gotta do photosynthesis. Uh, um, then I'm you know, one, one other uh, project that's coming to fruition. I've been working uh, in the Mr. Sierra Club uh, for some time. And these are uh, long-term projects, would be six months to get there. But um, what, what Ken was uh, uh, posting something yesterday uh, about the other side of the hill movie, there, there is... Um, there is a method now to where you screen a documentary that has a specific focus point and then create a panel discussion uh, about this. Um, so we have done this several times now with the Kiss the Crowns, and I have another one coming up with the Kiss the Crowns here, where we have the president of the Sierra Club engage the two directors of the film plus the founder of the organization and we are addressing the 3.7 million members of the Sierra Club to understand why we are focusing on regenerative agriculture and what they can do uh, for as eaters you know, to, uh, to engage and to support the development of these markets. Um, and so the, the other side of the hill is also a wonderful little uh, documentary that could be used to stimulate a conversation about rural community development. You know, and to bring in members of Congress to have very specific local community level discussions about what are our needs to make this work. So if, if anyone is interested in doing this kind of thing, I'm, I'm happy to support them. Love that class, thank you. <clears throat> We're pretty close to the time when I know I have to bounce and I'm torn here. Part of me says, uh, let's leave the, the call open and let whoever wants to be host, I'll pass host privileges. The other part of me just says, we're not going to make it through everybody every call. We should just wrap our call now. Any strong feelings one way or the other? Uh, raise your hand if you want to. If you really want to stay on the call and continue uh, the conversation, um, that's good. So why don't we um, just take a moment? I'm going to put what I have as the queue left. So apologies to Scott, Craig, George, Doug, Ingrid, and me. Um, 
we, uh, and by the way, my heuristic here from an early recommendation on the OGM calls is I go from the bottom up on my grid because as people join the call late, because at the beginning I was starting from the top and I was always getting the same few early, early, early risers. So if, if you're late in the process because you were early to the call, which is a weird penalty for, for being eager to be in the call, but uh, I can mix this up. Uh, and if you really want to go or go early or have to drop off, just ping me or DM me or, or whatever, and I'll make sure you're in the queue. Uh, so that, you know, there's no reason to, to worry about it. And it's not that I have a personal animosity toward anybody here. I'm very grateful for everybody who's on the call. Um, anyone have a last word for this call, just in the spirit of wrapping this call? Just, it's so great to hear from all of you. And um, I wish I could have heard more from those people who spoke and even more from those who didn't. So Scott. I'm with you on that. Scott, did you want to jump in? Uh, my update this week was going to be very, very short. A follow-up on my flipping my screen to black and white. So I have flipped my phone screen to black and white to make it less attractive and the rest of the real world more attractive because of the color. And it's working I, for you, it sounds like? I am using my phone one and a half to two hours less per day. Damn. The power of color, the allure of shiny objects. We are at heart just frogs. Monkeys. Uh, monkey, monkeys more evolved. Monkeys have like lots more going on than frogs, I think. Um, Sorry. Yeah. According to the frogs. That's true. That's true. The frog lobby says, says the opposite. Right. Very. I I know we need to wrap up. You didn't tell him who he who he spoke with this morning. Oh, that's Speaking right. Well, we didn't frogs. we didn't we didn't actually get to speak with her, but uh, we were on a call with Jane Goodall, um, who was who was is eighty seven and was so lucid and so on, and at the beginning gave this beautiful sort of opening journey into uh, the topic, which included. You know, she started working on chimpanzees and realized that their habitats were going to be destroyed because the people right next door had, you know, out of desperation, were busy eating up that habitat. And unless, unless we solved their problems, there were going to be no more chimps anyway. So she's got a whole bunch of other initiatives, but she was wonderful. Thank you for reminding me, April. Um, can highly recommend Jane Goodall and her, her organization is called Roots and Shoots. Root Roots and Shoots, there's the Jane Goodall Institute, which is for organizations and sort of the macro piece, but Roots and Shoots is for primarily children anywhere from preschool all the way up to the age of 28, post-university, and there are thousands and thousands of chapters, Jerry, you should mute, um, all over the world. I'm not muting because I have to bounce. Uh, so let's, uh, let's wrap the call, and thank you so much, everybody, for being here. This is terrific. Really appreciate all of you.